Hello, hello. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, is it afternoon already? Then? Okay. Right. Okay. So <laughs> welcome, everyone, to Harpo Seminar Series uh, 47. So the talk number is number nine, right, for this particular series. And today we have a special guest, um, Dr. Perin Chai Panya, okay, from uh, Department of Mathematics, uh, King Mungkut University of Technology, Hungary. Um, so today he's going to talk about um, that one, okay, an in <laughs> invitation to map transportation and it and its applications. Okay, please join me. Welcome, Dr. Perin. Please. Okay. So I suppose I have an hour, so I will not go too fast. Uh, and thank you for your kind introduction. And I'd like to express my gratitude to Ajahn Sikrin for inviting me to this quite unusual situation for me, <laughs> because normally I, I would give my lecture to mathematicians. And I'm sorry in advance if I cannot uh, explain some terms in physical meanings. So basically, my work is uh, in, I'm not sure is it pure or applied math, but uh, I suppose that my work requires both a firm theoretical background and some uh, computing ability. So let me start by uh, telling you how I get into this uh, subject of optimal transport or optimal mass transportation. So uh, I started my PhD back in 2013 where I decided to go to uh, Alexandrov geometry. So basically Alexandrov geometry is uh, a generalization of uh, manifold geometry but in Alexandrov geometry we do not uh, assume differentiability of the manifold. So uh, at some point we don't have the differential structure, but at some point we do have the differential structure. Uh, and the method that I used here can be applied to the study of optimal transportation or OT for short. And uh, that is how I enter into optimal transportation. Basically, it is uh, like an application of my uh, PhD work in Alexandrov geometry. But as I get more into uh, optimal transportation, I find that uh, optimal transportation also requires some special treatment because it enjoys some property, special property that general Alexandrov space does not have. <clears throat> so in this talk, I will uh, show you a little bit of uh, optimization method that I uh, studied in Alexandrov setting and then I will show you that uh, actually the geometry of the optimal transportation falls into the category that was introduced by Alexandrov and um, finally if time allows I will show you some of uh, the applications of the OT and I will focus the, uh, the applications uh, to, uh, to the area of computer vision. Okay, let me first talk a little bit about Alexandrov geometry and how to use this Alexandrov geometry in optimization. So, I suppose some of you may be familiar with uh, Riemannian manifold, if, 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 if my understanding is correct. And in Riemannian manifold, we have uh, so many notions of curvature. One of them is sectional curvature. Actually, you have more than uh, you have more than one. You have like Ricci curvature, you have Gaussian curvature, and so on. But uh, the one that I am interested in is the sectional curvature. And it turns out that uh, if your manifold have a sectional curvature bounded globally by some constant, then we can uh, characterize this section of sectional curvature bounds by using uh, a metric, met metrical terms. That means uh, you, don't, you don't need to calculate the metric curvature tensor, but instead you, you calculate uh, 
you can you can you can characterize that uh, curvature using only distance function. So by removing the uh, the curvature tensor to only the distance function, that means you can define the curvature bound in terms of uh, distance function. So you do not need uh, the differential structure here. So using this idea, Alexandrov uh, generalized the notion of curvature bound into general matrix space. So general matrix space means you have uh, any set, finite, countable, uncountable, continuous, or discrete. And you have a function, a distance function. So distance function is just a function uh, which is uh, symmetric. So the distance between two points, between A to B and B to A are the same. Uh, the distance is zero if and only if uh, it is the distance to itself. And it satisfies the triangle inequality, meaning, meaning that if you go directly from a point A to a point B, is always shorter than going to A and then to C and then C to B. So that's, that's all the action for uh, distance function. Uh, Alexandrov generalized the notion of uh, sectional curvature bound to general metric space using the idea uh, of metric characterization of sectional curvature. Well, what is the definition of sectional curvature bound? Uh, do, do you know the sectional curvature? Well, uh, sectional curvature intuitively is uh, the curvature when you consider only two-dimensional section of a tangent space. So you, you, you consider this uh, cross-section curvature. And bounds mean uh, either bounded above or below globally. And normally to, to define the sectional curvature, you, you need to use the differential structure. Okay, so when you, when you generalize this kind of uh, sectional curvature to general metric space, we call that uh, metric space with the curvature condition, Alexandrov space. And uh, therefore, we can, we can see Alexandrov space as a non-smooth extension of a Riemannian manifold. But actually, uh, when we consider Alexandrov space, we don't uh, talk about the dimension. Normally, when we, when we talk about Riemannian manifold, uh, we only consider finite dimensional uh, manifold. Actually, you can go beyond finite dimension, of course, but uh, the theory can be more complicated. And just for your information, oops, sorry, okay. Okay, just for your information, uh, this uh, metric characterization approach is also capable of describing metric properties of Lorentzian manifold if you're interested. So in this approach, they try to find metric characterization of time-like space or some, something like that. So here is how, uh, how Toponogov uh, characterized the sectional curvature bound. In metric space, we say that this metric space is uh, uh, of curvature bounded below by some constant kappa if this uh, <coughs> So on the left-hand side, you have the geodesic in, in Alexandrov space, and you consider this uh, Alexandrov angle. You compare this to the Alexandrov angle uh, in uh, Riemannian manifold with constant curvature kappa, and you try to compare the, the angle here and here. So if uh, the angle in the, Alexandrov, in the Alexandrov space is bounded below by this uh, Riemannian angle, then we say that uh, this metric space is of Alexandrov curvature bounded below. And we say that it is bounded above if this inequality changes signs. So in, in this uh, Alexandrov space, we have some tools and some properties that allows us to study optimization problem. Uh, I suppose here that X is Alexandrov space. So CBA means curvature bounded above and CBB means curvature bounded below. So if X is Alexandrov space, uh, we have, uh, we can construct the geodesic. And uh, for the case of uh, X being curvature bounded above, we can define this uh, resolvent function. And in the case of uh, curvature bounded below, we can define another function. So 
this resolvent and this gradient exponent are only defined in each cases. For example, if you have CBB, then the resolvent is not, def is not well defined. And I'd like you to notice these two because uh, we, will, we will compare these two, uh, these two operators to the OT theory. So uh, the first one, you, you want to minimize F, but maybe F is not so uh, well behaved. So you add some function here to regularize the property of the whole thing. And you hope that as the regularization parameter lambda goes uh, large, in this case it goes large, so that this term vanishes, uh, the, minimizer, the minimizer of this regularized function tends to the minimizer of F and a similar idea here. And it was uh, a result from 2015 by uh, Shinichi Ota and Palfia. Uh, if you are in curvature bounded above, then you keep iterating this operator, will we'll, we'll, we'll bring you to a minimizer of F, finally. And if you are in curvature bounded below, then you apply this uh, operator iteratively it will bring you to a minimizer of f. So by computing these two operators uh, iterative, iteratively, uh, you will arrive at an uh, approximate minimizer of the function that you are interested in. And uh, back in 2017, I and my uh, PhD supervisor uh, extend this idea to general vector fields in metric space. And uh, to do so, I have introduced um, a simplification of first order structure to replace the tangent space that uh, normally uh, we do not have that structure here. Okay, what I want to emphasize here is that uh, this resolvent operator, which is very stable, is only defined in CBA and the gradient exponent is only defined in CBB. And we will see that uh, what happened when we consider a very special case of uh, <clears throat> the geometry of the optimal transportation. So that was, uh, that was the tools that I found in my PhD study. And not only in my PhD, I still do this kind of research until, until, until now. And <clears throat> now let's see uh, what is what, what do I mean by uh, optimal mass transportation? So first we have to know mass transportation. This is mass transportation, but not in our sense. So here is the mass transportation that we are interested in. So <clears throat> let, let us think of this uh, mu. Mu is actually formally defined as a probability distribution. So we interpret this as the distribution of mass on the space. And what we'd like to do is that, given this initial uh, mass distribution, we want to take this mass and put it in this uh, form of like, you, you try to fill the hole in the ground. So this is the initial mass distribution and you want to transport this, these mass to this uh, terminal mass distribution. That is uh, what I mean by mass transportation. And you, you have uh, so many cases. For example, you may have the discrete one-dimensional mass distribution here. So you want to transport uh, this rate mass into this final mass distribution. So the height here means uh, for, for the red one means the mass are equally distributed to each mass point, and in the bottom, uh, the mass are differently distributed, but still you have like a total mass has to be equal. And if you go to the discrete case, but in two dimensional, so larger, larger points mean you have more mass at that point. So first you have a uh, mass which is equally distributed along these points, and then you want to transport 
the masses here to this uh, final distribution. So uh, at this point, you have larger amount of mass, same as this point, but for smaller points, you have smaller amount of mass. And similarly, if you consider this as a continuous mass distribution, you can do that also, and also for this. But can we think this like how the origin of the popularity distribution? I don't know. <laughs> so time evolution. Actually, actually, you will you will see at the at at the end that. Uh, we, we don't only have uh, the way to transport, but we also have the geodesic, which explain uh, how the mass is moved from time zero to time to the final time t, t equals to one, something like that. Uh, so you can interpolate between. So you could say two. something about time. time like that, it can be, because, uh, because to, to, to define the transportation of mass, you can, you can, Actually, it is like uh, the, the two ends of geodesics. But there is a description of geometry with it. Yes, right. yes. And that's uh, what I call the geometry of mass transportation. OK, so let me, let me mention that actually we have uh, more than one way to transport the mass. Right? You can uh, move, move here to here, move here to here, or you can move here to here first. So you have several ways to transport the mass. Into the final term, uh, into the terminal distribution, but uh, what we are trying to do is we try to uh, minimize the cost to transport. So that's why we call uh, our uh, subject optimal transportation because we want to find the optimal way to transport mass distribution from the initial distribution to the final distribution. And actually, we have two uh, formulations of optimal transportation. The first one was due to Monge, the French mathematician back in the time of Napoleon. And uh, the other one is quite recent, Kantorovich. Uh, he was a Russian mathematician. I think he obtained a Nobel Prize in economics. OK. And the two formulations have some have have a big difference, but if you view it intuitively, you will see that Monge is uh, Monge idea is simpler. But actually, this simpler idea has a very difficult and imposed uh, formulation. So let me see. Uh, let let me explain Monge formulation first. Monge formulation means you want to transport. Okay, the, the, red, the red one is the final distribution, and the blue one is the initial distribution. So in order to move uh, these two points to the final uh, distribution, you can either move x1 to here, x2 here, or you can move x1 here and x2 here. So one way is the solid arrow, and the other one is dotted arrow. Uh, this is... Uh, Munch formulation, you actually move the mass. I will say you move the mass, the whole mass at that point. You, you, don't, you cannot really split the point. So Munch formulation means you want to try to find a mapping T. T is a mapping, mean, uh, for example, one, way, one, one of the mapping is Tx1 equals to Y1 and Tx2 equals to Y2. And another, another mapping that is also uh, usable is t of x1 equals to y2 and t of x2 equals to y1. The problem is that sometimes we don't actually have this mapping t. For example, if we consider this uh, mass. Ah, sorry, for this mass you can, you can do it. Let me, okay. This may look a little uh, difficult, but let me go, go back he here first. OK, so suppose you have red mass and you want to transport it to the blue mass using Monge formulation. You cannot really do that because when you define uh, the mapping T, it means you uh, transport whole mass here to the other point. And you can see that 
uh, other other mass in in, in the red distribution are equally uh, distributed. So you cannot really move this uh, point to to this because uh, this point has lower mass uh, lower mass density. So you you cannot always you cannot always uh, transport the mass like that because in Munch formulation you move the whole mass at a point to another to another point, you, you do not allow splitting the mass. But in Kantorovich uh, notion, Kantorovich allow uh, you to split the point, split the mass. That means, let's say if you want to transport y2 back to x1 and x2, you cannot do that with Munch because you cannot split the mass here. But with uh, Kantorovich, you can split the mass y2 into uh, x1 and x2. And Kantorovich is actually this formulation. You want to find uh, the coupling. This is the coupling for which it uh, minimizes the expected cost. And uh, the, the definition of coupling is a little difficult to understand. But uh, when you take uh, the whole set in the second argument, you will get the marginal equals to mu and the other marginal equals to nu. To illustrate this, let me show you this uh, figure. Okay, you have, you have two spaces. You have x here and y here. You want to transport the mass from, okay, you want to transport the mass from this uh, distribution on the left to this distribution on the right. And what you define by coupling, uh, it is the prop density over this uh, product space for which when you take, uh, when you take uh, all the density along this line, you will have uh, the total mass equal, equals to, to this value. And if you take uh, the total mass along this line, what you get is this height. So this, this particular mass point has to be distributed all over, all over here. And similarly, all the mass distributed has to sum up to the final, uh, to the final density. It may look more complicated than Munch, but actually, this uh, formulation is much simpler when you when you look more in, more into the details. I will show you some more examples. So in this case, you want to transport alpha to beta, red uh, distribution to blue distribution. What you do here is maybe you can uh, transport whole mass here to this point, and you split this mass here to this point and this point, similar here and. Um, for the final point, you transport the whole mass. And what you have here is that when you sum up, when you sum up along the vertical axis, uh, the total mass here has to equal to this mass. The total mass along this vertical axis have to uh, sum up to this mass. Okay, and similar for this, this is, this is known as semi-discrete because the distribution you have on the left is continuous, but on the right is discrete. So it is semi-discrete. What we have here is that when you take a density somewhere here, this uh, density have to distribute it along this axis. So if you sum along this axis, it has to sum up to this density. If you sum along this axis, you have uh, this density. And similarly, if you sum along the vertical axis, uh, all the masses here sums up to this mass, all the masses here sum up to this mass, and so on. And similar for the continuous. So if you if you go slowly from discrete to continuous, you can, I think you can gain more intuition of, of, of this uh, couplings. So, uh, so for the picture in the middle, can we think that actually this is a way that we can discretize the, the continuous distribution mm. to like a discrete one? Is it Normally, when you do the computation, you have to discretize, yes. But it's not so easy to, to discretize 
the, the, the continuous distribution to, uh, to discrete distribution because you want the total mass equals to one. That is the definition of probability. Then, uh, so the, the whole process here is subject to uh, the conservation law, right? Conservation yeah, yeah, conservation of mass, of mass yes. So all, all the mass have to be conserved. No loss of mass. Okay. Actually, there are many discretization method of probability distribution, but I, I think that's out of scope for today. <laughs> okay, so from discrete to semi-discrete to continuous, you can see uh, what is mean by coupling. I hope you can gain more insight about couplings. This is also another interpret interpretation of uh, of couplings. So in the case of Monge, you, you transport one mass to another. But here you can see that we transport one mass to another two or one mass to an interval. So you have, uh, you, you can transport a single mass freely to other points. And you may notice that to compute the transport cost, uh, here you use uh, arbitrary function C. So C can be any, any uh, transportation cost function. It can be anything, but the, the most natural one may be you let C, the transport cost, depend on the distance between the two points. So the cost of the cost to transport the point x to uh, the final point tx is, can be computed by uh, the distance to the power p, something like that. So this is one of the most uh, natural way to compute the transportation cost. Okay, so it's here. It's the same formula. In 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 Wasserstein space, we we take a, a separate metric space. You can think of a Euclidean space of vectors if you'd like. So we take a, a, a separa separable metric space. And then you consider this space of all probability distributions with finite, sec uh, finite p moment. Okay, so you want this p moment to be finite. And then you equip this, uh, this space of prop distribution with this optimal transport cost. It turns out that this space equipped with this optimal transport cost is a metric space, meaning that this optimal transport cost has all the uh, properties of a distance function. So now if you want to uh, compute the distance between two prop distributions, you can, use, you can actually use this uh, optimal transport cost as one of the uh, distance function. So now you have the space of prop distribution together with a distance function. That means you can study somehow uh, the geometry, of, the geometry of, of this prop distribution. And if, this, if you feel uncom uncomfortable about the notion here, this is uh, a simplification. If you, if you consider a compact metric space, and if you think of Euclidean space, you, you can think of a a set which is close bounded like a box, sphere, something like that. So if you, are, if you restrict yourself to this compact set, then you can forget about these conditions. It, it is automatically satisfied. So you can consider this uh, p Wasserstein space over compact metric space. And the most natural one for, uh, for the choice of p is p equals to 1 and 2. And we have bad news that even if M is, uh, is a Euclidean space, then the geometry of Wasserstein is still not Euclidean. So as you lift the, space of, as you lift the data space from Euclidean to the distribution space, uh, the, the flatness is lost. You lost the flatness of the space. So you lost the linearity of the space. So in order to deal with uh, prop distribution, even in oh, even over uh, Euclidean space, you have to use different kind of geometry. And uh, worst news 
it's not a Euclidean space and it's not even a manifold. So this means we cannot really use uh, the geometry of manifold, which is very efficient because you have calculus over manifold. But good news is uh, this uh, Wasserstein space over Euclidean is an Alexandrov space. And it is an Alexandrov space with curvature bounded from below. So this is, this is where the Alexandrov uh, geometry enters the study of optimal transportation. And as long as I, as, as soon as I found out these properties, I think maybe I can use uh, some of my knowledge to, to, to solve some open problems in, in, in the setting of uh, optimal transportation. Now we have talked about uh, optimal transportation by this formulation. And we haven't tackled this uh, formulation yet, so how to compute this formulation? Is it difficult or is it uh, simple? This, the, the answer is that it can be simple and it can be difficult. And uh, in general, the complexity of calculating this optimal transport cost is uh, NP hard. So uh, we have to restrict ourselves to uh, nice support space M here. And the one that I will show you today is the simplest one meaning that you have uh, the Wasserstein space over finite set here. So in this subsection, we will, we will, I, I will show you how to compute the optimal transport cost for finite mass points. Uh, before we go into more details, we recall that uh, the probability simplex, and n probability simplex is defined to be this one. So it is the vector for which each of the entry are positive and sums up to one. So we can, we can see that if you have a1, a2, a3, and so on up to an, you can consider each ai as the probability uh, assigned to the mass point xi. Okay, and in general, we can, we can, we can represent uh, any uh, prop distribution of finite mass point by uh, using this summation. Please do not uh, confuse between this sigma n, which is probability simplex, and this summation. Actually, they are of a little slightly different fonts. Okay, so when you have uh, when you have finite mass points, then the Monge formulation can be simplified, let, us, let, let me recall you a little bit. So this is the original uh, Monge uh, formulation. If we consider the finite mass points, we can simplify uh, Monge optimal transport cost to this problem. And you can see that uh, actually this is not difficult. This is linear function. CI is a cost matrix which is the uh, Cij is the, is the cost to move the unit mass from x1 to yj. So you have finite masses, so you can represent the cost in the, in, 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 in the matrix. And since this is a matrix, this is linear. But the difficulty is in the constraint. We need a constraint. Uh, we simplify the mapping uh, of Monge remember the mapping T, we can simplify that to mapping of the indices. So we define sigma to be uh, the mapping from the indices of uh, finite, finite masses of uh, n masses to m masses. And we can simplify the uh, push forward condition to this uh, summation. And since we require uh, sigma to satisfy this constraint, uh, this minimization problem becomes difficult because the constraint is not convex. Actually, the constraint is very difficult to, to tackle. So, Monge formulation is still difficult in finite end point masses. How about uh, Cantorovich transportation? It turns out that the Cantorovich tra transportation simplifies to a very uh, simple linear programming problem. 
So remember when, when we talk about uh, Cantor, which we allow splitting of mass, and uh, we define the splitting of mass using the couplings. And this coupling simplifies to this set. So given uh, probability distributions alpha and beta, alpha is the initial and beta is the terminal distributions. We define this uh, coupling to be the set of all matrices whose entries are positive. And we have uh, P times this vector equals to alpha and P transpose times this vector uh, turns out to be L, uh, beta. And we can notice that this is the system of n plus m equality constraint, linear equality constraint. So u alpha beta is a convex polytope. And uh, the, the objective function is just this product, which is linear. So Cantor-Wish problem in finite mass points reduces to this linear programming problem. So the problem is, uh, we, we will feel that this Cantor-Wish formulation is more friendly to us now. But again, computing linear, uh, solving a linear programming problem can be difficult when the dimension is very high. The cost to compute this is, is not so cheap, still expensive, but solvable. We have, we feel more comfortable solving this than solving this non-convex uh, constraint problem. So in order to solve this problem more efficiently, we call that this is a linear programming problem. And linear programming problem is slow because uh, of, because of two reasons. The first reason is that it lacks the convexity. It is convex, but it's, the convexity strength is not so much because it's like straight line. If you have, uh, if you have large, uh, large gradient, then you have a big hope for fast convergence. But when you have linear, the gradient is always the same. And sometimes you encounter sparsity problem if the matrix is, if the matrix has too many zeros, you are stuck. You are not going anywhere. In anywhere. So, in order to speed up the the computation of this uh, optimal transport cost in the sense of Kantorovich, we introduce a regularization problem. So, similar to the one that I showed you earlier, we want to minimize f but we regularize that function f by using some quadratic function d square. Uh, it's the same here. So we want to enhance the convexity strength to the linear objective function, and we hope that the regularized solution remains reasonably close to the original solution. So you will lose something, but you gain the uh, convexity strength. So by doing by 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 wanting to to regularize the the function, we 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 use this entropic regularization technique. So given a, a, a coupling matrix P, you define the entropy of, of of this matrix matrix P here. I do not know why you have minus one here. Actually, it it it, it should look like something like Shannon entropy. Anyway, this. Uh, this entropy function is proved to be strongly concave. Strongly concave means when you, when you take negative of that function, it is strongly convex. And you can see that it is strongly concave because when you compute it Hessian, it is minus diagonal of 1 over Pij, and you know that Pij is less than 1. So uh, you have <coughs> the strong convexity from this Hessian computation. And instead of only computing this uh, objective function, you add to the objective function minus uh, epsilon times uh, the entropy. Remember that the entropy is strongly concave, so the negative of the entropy is strongly convex. And you time epsilon here, the scaling constant. So if your epsilon is small, that means you're, emphasi you're emphasizing on the, op the first objective function. And if, you, if, if your epsilon is large, that means uh, you're emphasizing more on the entropy function. 
Okay, and since the whole objective is strongly convex, you know that this problem admits a unique uh, solution, which is denoted by P epsilon here. You can see that uh, as, as we vary the value of epsilon, uh, the entropic, you, you have the entropic effects on your, on your objective function. So when your epsilon is small, you can see from here that when your epsilon is small, it approaches zero, this term vanishes, and the solution will converge to this original solution. But not only that, we know that it will converge to a very specific solution of the original problem. That solution have to give, uh, that, that, that solution, you can see that the P is the solution, uh, that solution has to satisfy the maximum entropy constraint. So you are not only solving for, for, for the uh, solution of the original problem, but you are solving in such a way that you will also obtain the maximum entropy in the solution set. And in contrast, if you, sorry, this has to be infinity. So in the first one, epsilon goes small, and in the second one, epsilon goes large. So as your epsilon goes to infinity, we can see that uh, the solution goes to this product. And by epsilon goes, goes to this product, it means uh, it will convert to, to to the coupling, which gives you maximal entropy and not a solution of the original problem at all. And uh, this is the illustration. If C is the uh, cost, cost matrix, actually, maybe we can visualize it in the augmented dimension so that C can be viewed as a vector. So C is a vector here, and you can see that the original uh, level set is perpendicular to this vector C. So the solution without any regularization is here. And as you uh, increase epsilon, the entropy, the entropy function starts to kick in. So the, solu the solution moves further into the set. And actually, you have also uh, a very nice relationship with uh, the kubak weibler divergence. So if you give, if, if, if you are given two couplings, P and K, so couplings are simply uh, probability distribution on the product space. You can compute this uh, divergence by this formula. I, I think you are more familiar this, with this formula than me. I don't know why there is these two terms anyway. And if you take K to be a very particular choice of uh, coupling defined by the cost function here, so exponential of the cost function divided by the regularization constraint, uh, the regularization uh, constant. Then we have that uh, uh, the solution p epsilon is the solution of this problem. The solution p epsilon is actually the projection with respect to the kubak Kuh leibler uh, divergence to this uh, particular choice of couplings. Now we can use optimal transport to, uh, to apply it in optimization problems too. Earlier we applied optimization problems to solve opt optimal transport, but now we want to use optimal transport to solve optimization. Suppose we are going to solve uh, for a minimizer of this function f, and this function f is a real function defined over the space of uh, probability distribution with finite second moment. And this function f can be uh, decomposed into two components. First one is h. h is a convex function h. It can be non-smooth. And the other one is an energy function of a smooth convex function, g, defined on the, uh, it is defined on the, on the support space Euclidean space of d dimensional. So the energy function is defined to be the integral of, of g, okay, and with respect to mu, mu is the prop distribution, so it is the expected uh, energy with respect to this mass distribution. And you can see that by 
to, to solve this problem, we introduce uh, an alternative algorithm like this. So mu n plus one is a prop distribution defined by pushing forward the gradient, the, 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 the gradient step of mu n. And uh, mu n plus one, is the next step, is defined to be uh, the regularized minimizer of h. And you can, you can compare uh, these two steps with the one that I mentioned earlier. So recall that when you have uh, CBA of Alexandrov space, you can define this function. And if you have CBB of the Alexandrov space, you can similarly define uh, this function. But in this space uh, of, uh, this is Wasserstein space, it is curvature bounded below, so it is CBB, it's not CBA. But we can define both of the, of the operators. So it's, it, it enjoys a very special properties. So both of, the, both of the operators are defined. And to use uh, the first one alone, you can see that uh, it, will, it will be unstable somehow along this boundary and this boundary. You can see that it oscillates a lot. But by using this implicit second, second kind of uh, operator, it's more smooth here. So that uh, reflects some uh, stability of the algorithm. Let me mention that, let me mention some of the applications. Some applications here means optimization in uh, the Wasserstein space. So why do we need to do optimization over the prop distribution? So here are some applications where I didn't mention how to apply them directly, but these are the applications when we do optimization in the space of prop distribution. The first one is uh, you want to find the geodesic of the Wasser, uh, Wasserstein geodesic. Remember that uh, the space of prop distribution here is an Alexandrov space, so you can define the geodesic on that space. And it turns out that uh, given this uh, initial histogram, you want to equalize the histogram to this final one, you can define a geodesic. And then you can, like, going along the geodesic to, to see which, uh, which image you like the most. This is like uh, con contrast uh, adjustment. The second one is color transfer. This is also uh, attained by solving the Wasserstein geodesic. You are given two images. The first one is this, and the final one is this. If you cannot see what is this, this is promagonate. Taptim now. This is the promagonate, and the final one is the farm. So what you want to do here is you want to compute uh, the divergence from uh, this image to this image by using only the color distribution. Uh, color uh, features. So you can see that finally the color of the final image is transferred to the original image. And similarly, if I go, go back from this to this, using the color uh, information of this image, you can see that finally uh, this image will have the color profile of the original one. You can also see this uh, face interpolation. The left-hand side is the phase interpolation using Wasserstein uh, approach, and the right-hand side is the classical approach using Euclidean uh, geometry. And you can see that, actually, if you view it closer, you can see the difference. Uh, the face on the left-hand side uh, is more crisp. You have a clearer image on, on this one when you apply the Wasserstein space. And if you apply the Euclidean space, uh, the faces in between are kind of blurry. They are like uh, of the, the two images from uh, left and right uh, overlap each other's. So they result in uh, a blurry image. This one is averaging image. You compute the barycenter of, uh, of several distributions. So you have this one, two, three, four, five, one, two, like 50 uh, random image of a circle. The circle is randomized. Uh, the position is randomized. The radius of the circle is also randomized. And you want to average these images 
on the left hand side if you directly use the Euclidean mean you will get this so all of the circles and gray out but if you apply the Wasserstein mean you have this and it is right at the center because all the circles are generated using the normal distribution so what I'd like to emphasize is that uh, the geometry of OT is actually in the territory of Alexandrov geometry. So the right approach to, 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 to OT may come from uh, the study of Alexandrov geometry. And although the approach is not so simple, you can see that it has uh, good applications, especially when applied to uh, computer vision and actually to machine learning applications too. Uh, you can see that uh, by applying OT to uh, computer vision, you gain a lot more interpretability of, uh, of, of the result. For example, if you want to average these circles, this one is not so interpret interpretable. And still, big room for improvements and developments. I'd like to mention that uh, for example, this, this uh, algorithm was developed earlier this year. So the, the area is still young and there are a lot of room for improvements. And this approach is not, uh, it's not artificial. I'd like to mention that uh, it was largely developed by people from Facebook, Google, Sony, Ricken and uh, top data scientists like George Hinton and Michael Jordan. So uh, since these are commercial companies and they study this uh, approach, I think it has to be some importance in the theory. Okay, so thank you very much for all of you. Okay. So any questions? So it seemed to me that actually the, the whole approach based on the, the chart test way yeah. right, mm -hmm. is the, the key word, right? Yes, because yes. You, you do things on like in terms of geometry, it's meaning yeah. you do things on, you do transport man, along the geodesic. Yes, yes. That is, um, that is a way that you would optimize. Yes, correct. But, but yeah, of course that your, your space is not well <laughs> equipped with uh, differentiable Yes, yes that's, that's true. Then you have to find another way to, to, to do things. And, and to mention, uh, when you have a manifold, you know that the manifold is not linear, but the tangent space is always linear. So the linearity is always there for you, but in this case, you don't have the linear, you, you do not have the linearity at all. So you cannot really compute. Everything is computed geometrically. But, but I still don't um, clear why they do, well, they choose the, the entropy to be like a, a um, regulated function, something like that. I don't know too. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be something else? Like some other function? Yeah, theoretically, yes. Theoretically, theoretically, yes. You can use any strongly convex function. Yeah, uh, that, the thing is, you need some convex yeah. property, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, but but it turns out that using this kind of regularization function, uh, it speeds up a lot. Actually, the the paper that published this regularization, they call this method light speed computation of Wasserstein. Light speed computation of OT. So it's very efficient, but I don't know the reason behind that. Okay. Interesting. So, well, uh, if, well, you, well, if you have a question, we can discuss after. Well, firstly, with the speaker after this. <laughs> okay, Let me, sure. well, join, please join me to thank Dr. Brain again. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you.